stories in my life. What am I without them? I don't want to live without them. And I don't want other people to live without them. That's kind of my guiding mission. This is the Ideas Lab podcast, where you can learn from great creative and entrepreneurial minds how to turn your ideas into original businesses, books, and brands. Because in a crowded world, it pays to stand out. This is your host, John Williams, best-selling author and founder of the Ideas Lab London. While some people struggle to find good ideas for projects to pursue, as creative people, we often have the opposite problem. We have too many ideas, and our challenge is deciding which ones to pursue and how to make them happen. That's why I was particularly excited for this episode of the podcast to meet with Damien Barr. Damien is an award-winning writer, journalist and presenter, and he's founder of the prestigious London Literary Salon. And he's recently been appointed by the Savoy as their literary ambassador, including setting up a book butler service for guests at the famous hotel. There was so much I wanted to ask Damien from how he wrote his memoir, Maggie and Me, that went on to win Sunday Times Memoir of the Year, to how he launched the London Literary Salon at seeing guests uh, of the likes of Brett Easton Ellis, Lionel Shriver and David Mitchell. But more than that, how he's created such a unique, busy, creative and fun career, including some hilarious things that seem to only happen to Damien, uh, such as when he was in New Zealand, he managed to get himself into a light-hearted Twitter spat about cheese with the Prime Minister. This episode was recorded at the Savoy Hotel itself on the Strand in central London. We were in a beautiful suite with a fantastic view of the London skyline. And just for authenticity, we interrupted somewhere near the start by one of the famous Savoy butlers. Check out the show notes on the website to get links to everything Damien talks about, plus photos and video clips. Go to theideaslab.org forward slash podcast. Hi, it's John Williams here, and I am with Damien Barr, who is the Savoy's literary ambassador. And you do so many interesting things. There's so many things I want to ask you about not just about your writing and the literary salons you run, but about how you've managed your creative career and how you choose what to do next. But, but we've got to start here because we're actually in one of the suites of the Savoy, which is very nice. And you have a role here. Do you want to explain what that is? Um, I do, yes. So I'm the first ever literary ambassador um, for the hotel. Um, the day that they appointed me, I did have some Ferrero Rocher and it was a delicious treat. Um, so as a literary ambassador for the Savoy, um, I am responsible for rejuvenating and running their writer in residence scheme. Mm-hmm. So they had one over a decade ago, which is Michael Morpurgo, um and Kathy Letty and people mm-hmm. coming and staying in the hotel. And then they had no expectation that they would write anything. So um, I have regenerated the scheme so writers come and stay in the hotel mm-hmm. um, and, but they write a short story or an essay while they're here and something about the experience of living in this incredible place which has an amazing literary heritage you know there's a reason for doing this it's not a gimmick mm-hmm. it's not marketing it's the fact that you know Chaucer started writing the Canterbury Tales on this site Blake lived in a house <laughs> that was you know on the forecourt where the Leak Fountain now is and every 20th century writer of great note had their launch party here. You really? Know, yeah, no Coward, uh, Winston Churchill, Elaine Stretch, Richard Harris. These are people who've lived in the hotel, but lots and lots of writers mm. just use the hotel all the time. And the hotel doesn't keep a tab on that because, you know, because of where the hotel is, penguins right next door, you yeah. know, there are forever writers trooping through this place <laughs> and, and having good fun with it. So um, um, so we have this scheme whereby they, they write something uh, creative, they write a piece about their experience. They might be a guest at my salon here, Oh, sorry. Is that our door? That's our that's our door. <laughs> that's the surface. Should we find right out who's at the door? Oh, maybe this is the water. I think this will be our we water. Should this we I should have ordered a martini. We're actually doing an interview at the moment. One of the butlers. Okay. Um, so one of the other things that we'll be doing um, is creating a cocktail with the American bar uh, for the writers in residence. So either inspired by them or by their book, and they can work with the staff to create a cocktail. How nice is that? That's a hard day in the office. And so our writers and residents reflect much better, I think, the the diversity of publishing and of the people who come along to the salons. So the first three will be Garth Greenwell, the American writer who unveiled 
his novel here at a salon called What Belongs to You, um, and then Aminata Forna, um, whose latest novel is partly set in the hotel oh, wow. by happy coincidence. Um, and then Sarah Perry, uh, who also unveiled her new novel, Melmoth, which is very scary, and she'll be the very first one in starting in October. So, wow. yeah, it's exciting. Nice That's gig fantastic. for them. Yeah, I know. So yeah, and I when I heard about it, I thought I had to I had to come and ask you about this and how you landed this job, yeah. this gig, and um, but there's other parts to it as well. So you're mm-hmm. also curating. So apart from running the salon, the yeah. writer residence program, you're also creating the book butler program. What is that about? So if you travel a lot and your listeners and viewers do, and um, my greatest horror is not missing a flight or anything else. Um, because you can get on another plane it's not taking books or yeah. taking the wrong books it's horrible <laughs> yes. like, if you've ever had to try and sort of read a serial packet or the Gideon's Bible it's not a good look and so but, well just narrowing down the hundred books I would like to take yes. down to uh, the the four books that I can practically take without feeling embarrassed how long would you take four books for? actually I'm lying I really yeah. took about six or seven yeah exactly I and that's not including Kindle so I, what I do is I ship my books ahead. So if I'm going away for more than a week, mm. I will post my books to the, to the, the hotel where I'm staying yeah. so I don't have to carry them. So it's top tip. You don't have to put them in your hand like luggage then or yeah. your luggage lungs. Um, so um, so what, what I wanted to do was, you know, provide a service to guests in the hotel um, who are traveling from all over the world uh, of books and not just you know any old books pe- books that people have left or whatever but actually bu- books that are curated um, and edited um, based on the hotel's character and also partly chosen by the hotel staff so um, our manager Mr Barnes has chosen five titles um, Declan from the American Bar has chosen five titles and um, we've people um, in the restaurants choosing titles mm. so based on their interests so book, you know food drink um, history for Mr Barnes yeah. so you know so the, the, and I will curate a seasonal choice as well um, mm. for for guests so we're going to be building a library in the hotel you know a hotel is supposed to be a home from home and you can't have a home without books so yeah. the book butler is you call up and you say what you're interested in um, and, and they can make a recommendation from our list and then they appear the tray and the books on it and, and that's that so that's the other kind of component I love it I, I was imagining that people could kind of phone up and go, I'm in this mood, what should I have? Well, they can do that. And we've got, we've, we've, because we've got um, uh, contemporary fiction, um, poetry, memoir, you know, we've got all these different categories. So, you know, one of the, one of the things I'm going to be doing on that list is sort of recommending this would be a book for mm-hmm. somebody who's, you know, telling about homesick or, you know, who wants to find out, fall in love with London or, or mm-hmm. whatever it is. So a bit, little bit of bibliotherapy in there. Yeah. So, and another part of the role is helping the hotel position themselves in the literary world. So, mm. what a thing that we have coming up now is a, a collaboration with Judith Kerr, who wrote the wonderful children's book *The Tiger Who Came to Tea*, mm. and her publisher, um, and also some ceramicists who are going to be making special tea cups and saucers, mm. um, and they're going to be tiger teas to celebrate the anniversary of the yeah. book in the hotel. So, part of what I'll be doing is is kind mm. of mediating, being an ambassador. For the for the hotel and also for the people who come to me to see if it would be a good a good match. Wow, so that's that, 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 that's a great idea, and I, I I just think that's so much fun as well. It is fun. It's great fun. And it, so part of what you do here is you run the um, you run a literary salon, which you've actually been running now for ten years. I think that's how I first heard about you because you're running it at Shoreditch House. Before that's where I, we started. Yeah, in the distant mists of time. T- ten years ago. Yeah. What was the idea? Well. What, what, there's a few questions I've got about that. But what describe what the the, the, lit, the the salon is. So it's nothing to do with here and it's everything to do with what happens, in, I guess, in your head and in your heart. It's about mm. books and the people who love books. Yeah. And I started it because I wanted to go to a book event that didn't feel stuffy or, yeah. or excluding or austere or where there wasn't a pressure to buy a book or anything like that. So Shortage House said, well, you know, well, let's, let's, you know, why don't you do something for mm-hmm. us? And, and I said to Nick, okay, well, I'd like to bring back the idea of the salon, which is sort mm-hmm. of 17th, 16th century idea of 
a, a creative space largely run by women. And I call myself a salonier and I use the female spelling, not because my French is really bad, which it is, but because I want to honor those earlier women, mm. Madame Joffre, Madame Pompadour, those women who created those spaces um, where people could share new work and it be a conversation. Yeah. So the salon is a conversation, not a transaction. We do not sell books in the room and we have never sold books in the room mm. um we don't want authors to feel under pressure to sell we don't want our salonistas to feel mm. under pressure to buy and there's another practical reason for that which is that very often in fact almost always the work is new so the work is maybe not even finished so maggie o'farrell you know reading printer fresh pages helen fielding wow. reading the start of the new budget jones's diary uh you know david nichols reading one day you know these are books that that, you know that were barely finished or it was a proof maybe so there's not even a book available to buy so so that's a big part of what we do so we always say that we're exclusive but not excluding and that is really important to us you know we get new material we also feel comfortable sharing personal Mm. information personal stories um but it's not um it's not about sales Although, in the yeah. fact, it, although it does actually sell lots of books, yeah, but not I in the end. No, that's really interesting. And it's a good example, isn't it, of thinking, because you've done lots of these things that seem very original, very striking, but you created the event you wanted to go to, basically, yes, totally. which is a good principle. Yeah, and I still want to go to it. And when I stop mm. going to it, wanting to go to it, I'll stop doing it. Right, yeah. You know, um, our audience skews younger and is more diverse. Mm. There are more men there. Mm. Um, but the very first one was in Shoreditch House. We wanted to get 30 people. 50 <laughs> people came. We couldn't all fit in the snug. Some of your listeners and readers will, will yeah. remember the snug. And so we graduated from the snug to the biscuit tin. And the biscuit tin was a bigger room, but still it was really full. And what was quite funny is the 10 pin bowling alleys next door. So every mm. now and then somebody would be reading something and it might be quite emotional. And then you get strike next door and everybody's kind of laughing. And um, so, you know, and we've always believed in hospitality. So even yeah. then there was free food, then it was pizza. Um, mm. Now you get a, a welcome drink at the Savoy and it's very nice. Um, and I remember when we, you know, I remember when we didn't use microphones mm. because, um, you know, we just didn't need to. The room wasn't that big, you know, but it soon got to the point. I remember John mm. Waters turning to me and saying, if there's a fire in here, you're in trouble <laughs> because there are people lying on the floor and people, you know, leaning against the wall. I did not see John Ward as a fire as a fire safety nut. That, that. He is a, <laughs> he is a proper a proper man. He's 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 a very uh, he's 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 at once um, anarchic yeah. and and on the other hand very orderly, um, which right. is an appealing set, like that. Of, appealing yeah. set of opposites. He's very good. He also said to me. If you ever do signings, he said, and somebody asks you to mm. sign a colostomy bag, be sure to use a felt tip. Oh, and no. when I thought about that, I was like, oh, my God. I yeah, that really happened. You know, you. I'm yeah. sure that really did happen to him. But he's great. So, so the style started then 10 years ago, yeah. and we're just about to have our 10th anniversary. And really, in that time, live literary events in the UK have kind of followed the music industry in a sense, that yeah. they're much more towards a live model. Yeah. Um, and we've had lots of different partners over the years that we've that we've involved, that we've worked with, who have been interesting mm. and interested, I think. Mm. You know, we spend a lot of time saying no to people. We're like, no thank you, Amazon. Right. Uh, no thank you. We've, we've Lots of publishers over the years have tried to sponsor the salon and we're like, no, yeah. we're independent. You know, we're independent. Yeah. We don't want to, you know, no, you can't pay to have your author there. No, we don't do that. <laughs> lots of events do. Wow. And we don't. Yeah, and, and it's hugely popular because I remember when he used to do it, it was free originally and it yeah. was and and then it got to the point where the tickets were sell out within sixty seconds, you know, yeah. the free tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's it's just been uh, amazing. I still haven't been funny. I don't think I ever came to one because well, well I just got into it. On that. I know, definitely. Yeah, the thing is people the, the thing is that we started a podcast mm. for people who couldn't come or who couldn't get in. That's yes. the only reason we started oh, yeah, the yeah. podcast. It's because I would get all these disappointed emails from people going, I I came and I queued in the rain and I couldn't get in yeah. and I'd be, and I'd feel so guilty about it. So we started a podcast, not as some kind of amazing original thoughtful idea we started yeah, yeah. a podcast for people who couldn't get in yeah. and now that podcast is we see it all around the world because through mm. SoundCloud you can see where people are listening you know it's had mm. over a quarter of a million listens and it's now carried on British Airways on all their flights over four hours it's, oh, really? it's their in-flight um, it's their most downloaded in-flight uh, audio that's not music basically wow. where people are talking <laughs> It's incredible. Um, and how do you, when you were starting out, how did you get 
famous authors to appear. I mean, how did you... (laughs) Is there some trick to that? (laughs) I I, I think... I don't honestly know the answer to that question. It... I think passion, I think because I love mm. books and I wanted yeah. to have authors that I was interested in talking to, that I wanted to ask questions and also that I wanted to ask the questions that were not questions they maybe are used to being asked mm. or just for the questions that I was interested in. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in as much also the author's story, their personal story as I am in the, in the book. So very few people have said no over mm. the years. I can think of two. Right. Wow. That said no because they didn't want to, and it, in both instances, because we didn't sell books. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, but usually it's just a scheduling thing. So I mean, I'd love yeah. to. I'd love to do many more. We what we watch that about one a month, not one mm. a month here, one a month somewhere in the world, because we do them at literary festivals and yeah. with the British Council, we've toured Moscow, Istanbul, Auckland, Sydney, all these places. Wow. But um, we, you know, I think people are just keen to reach a different audience maybe or yeah. have a bit of fun on stage um, mm. you know we don't have a green room you know so you might end up going to the loo and standing there peeing next to Brett Easton Ellis or something like that <laughs> yeah. you know I think that's part of the Which excitement terror for people probably, <laughs> probably, probably, probably would be um, but you know I, 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 I think that that's that's the nature of our event mm. and it's nice being here because of the history of stories here but mm. also you know this is a place which is uh, which is um, incredibly welcoming yeah. um, and which, although it's very swanky and very mm. nice and very deluxe and, and, and all of those things, isn't snobby. Um, That's right, isn't, actually, isn't, yeah. isn't don't come in, you know. It, it's, you know, it's, it's very open. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And I think it'll be interesting to see what the writers come up with who are staying here, yeah. what stories they, you know, what stories they write. It's different from staying somewhere that's very modern, like a W or, or something like that. Yeah. Which, you know, similarly luxurious, but has a different feel, I think. This is more like, I think this is more like home and also it's got more history. I mm. think what's interesting about the Savoy is, is that, you know, history, um, history will only get you so far. Mm. Um, and if you just talk about history, you become history. Yeah, and right. what they're doing with the salon is, is they're having all these world firsts and they're attracting all these people uh, and they're making history. So, mm. you know, they're world premieres um, of, of fantastic new writers um, and, you know, the mix of people in the audience is, you know, we get all those writers back, you know, so you mm. look out into the audience and you'll see Jojo Moyes, you'll see Polly Sampson, you'll see David Gilmore, you'll see Rachel Johnson, you'll see Kirsty mm. Walker, you'll see all those people because they're having a good time. Yeah. You know, not because they're paid to be there or because they're, 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 they're you know, they're having to do anything. They just want to come to an event and, and yeah. enjoy it. So, And you're an author yourself of, is it? Well, it'll be three books. Yeah, it'll be is three right? books. It's very yeah. funny. I always forget about my poor, my poor first child. Um, <laughs> which so was my, about the quarter-life crisis. Yes, which yeah. now feels great because I'm so <laughs> ancient now that it's such a long time ago. I wrote that book when I was 24 mm. based on a series of columns in the Times and that was just uh, a phenomenon that I sort of made up and, became, you know, yeah. and then you know, it came out in America at the same time and it became a a thing a household and yeah. people talk about it quite routinely yeah that's right I still hear about it now yeah I mean it's still a problem it's still a yeah, thing right. yeah right um, and it's even more of a problem than it was I can imagine book, that yeah. but social media has amplified all these mm. things so that was that was when I was 24 and then in my early 30s I wrote a memoir which I always think was sort of my first serious book um, mm. called Maggie and Me which was yeah. the Maggie in question is both Margaret Thatcher and also my granny who's called Maggie but you oh, have to I change see. all the, no- yeah. the names in a, in a memoir so mm-hmm. nobody really knows that but yeah so Maggie and me and it came out the week that she died yeah, then which was that is an unbelievable timing. bit of you know uh, of a coincidence and I wanted to write that book because I grew up in the west of Scotland an area that she was not kind to my dad mm-hmm. was a steel worker in industry she was not kind to but there was as a child, she had an, a strange appeal for me yeah. um, because I think she was different. People hated her. Mm. I felt different. I felt hated. I felt misunderstood. Mm. So I'm not uh, Thatcher right in the sense that I subscribe to her values, but I mm. suppose I am in the sense that I am a product of that generation. Here I am sitting talking about being entrepreneurial and yeah. all those sorts of values that she, you know, um, that she uh, shared, shall we say, at the time. So um, I wanted to write a book that was not damning horror or not, and not sort of 
beatifying. And I wanted yeah. to write a book that was like, well, this is what my life was like because partly because of this woman. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and it's been it's been quite a quite a trip. Yeah. I mean, it's been received really well, and it's it. it how old is it now? It's now it came out in two thousand and thirteen. So it's five years since it came out. It's just mm. gone into another reprint and. Brilliant. It's just been optioned by the BBC to be a six-part nice. series, which is being adapted by Andrea Gibb, who wrote, writes Call the Midwife, among other many, wow. many things. She's amazing. So that's really exciting. Um, who, do you, who do you have play you? Some then? precocious child. Some <laughs> a precocious child. Um, I don't know. I'm more interested in who will play my mum. I was talking about my, yeah. talking about it with my mum the other day. So, so, um, <laughs> so that, 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 what's amazing about that book is that it was a very tough childhood. Yeah. And... I think that people sort of think that uh, that stuff doesn't go on in the way that you know mm. that it did. Perhaps somehow as a society we've progressed to a great degree. And in actual fact, you know, home is still the most dangerous place for a lot of children yeah. to be. And so I hear, I hear now. It used to be every day. It's probably now a couple of times a week mm. from a reader where yeah, they'll get in touch God. and tell me their own story. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that is a real privilege. Mm. That's the joy of that and I, and I wrote that book you know I didn't write that book thinking oh it's going to be a bestseller or any of this I wrote that book for myself mm. um, and which I think you know again is something I have in common with the salon mm. it's sort of self generated not to say I've done it all on my own because there are so many people involved with the salon there's a team of eight people and they're fantastic mm. and with the um, with the books too you know that, that's your agent that's your publisher that's your editor yeah. and it's also all the people who are encourage you and support you and yeah. nurture you, yeah. you know, all the other writers as well. So, I mean, lots of, I just started reading it the other day. It's beautifully written, what I've okay. read of it. And um, uh, I get a lot of people, I, I meet a lot of people who want to write books. I actually run a course on how to write a, a successful nonfiction book. Mm-hmm. But I also have a lot of people who follow what I do who are interested in writing fiction. Mm. And a lot of people start with some kind of memoir, whether mm. they admit it or not. Mm. Mm. That can be a recipe for disaster, of course. You created something beautiful, I think, with Maggie and me. But for a lot of people, it becomes something that no one else would want to read. Mm. So how do you, apart from the ability to write and, yeah. and those things which are a prerequisite, is there something, did, did you feel like, okay, I can write something which is going to resonate with other people? Is there a way that you approach writing a memoir where it feels like it's not just going to be uh, for you, it will actually connect with people. With the wider world. Yeah. Um, well, yes. I mean, obviously there is, because memoir and creative nonfiction of the kind that you're talking about is hugely successful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. lots and lots of books are sold in that way. I do work, I have taught some memoir courses through The Guardian mm. and UEA, and I do work privately um, editing memoir, but also novels. Mm. And I work with people who write both. And I have just completed a novel, yeah, which right. will be out next year. Yeah. So I've now been through that process myself. Yeah. Of, um, I mean, the, the things they have in common, you need to sit down, you need to apply your bum to the seat, mm. you need to get offline, you need to stop looking at Twitter. Um, excuse me. And, um, you know, and you need, to, you need to be there for your book, yeah. you know, and it involves saying no to all kinds of temptations in the world. Somebody said to me yeah. um, recently, they were like, do you really think Charles Dickens would have written all those books if he had Netflix and Twitter? And I'm like, Probably <laughs> not. So I, I, I think you have to be realistic about, mm. about how much time and energy you can devote to it, whether you have a room of one's own or, or not. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I think I'm interested in the differences and the commonalities with fiction and non-fiction. The story mm. has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. It has to have characters, whether those characters are real people or whether they're real people just to you. Mm-hmm. You know, um, And I think you have to leave space for the reader. I think it's really important mm. when you're telling a story to leave space for the reader. So, And that is the work of editing. So I spent a long time editing Maggie and Me and I spent a long time editing my novel, which is called You Will Be Safe Here. I spent a year editing that novel uh, and it was cutting 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 to leave space for the reader to, to think well what do I think about this what do I feel about this yeah. you know so it's not the same as journalism um, or uh, or sort of marketing or something where you're you know where you tell people what you're going to tell them mm. tell them what you're telling them and then tell them what you told them yeah. you know you just can't do that you can't be that uh, you know, um, uh, aggressive uh, mm. in in fiction or creative nonfiction. You have to let readers think. Actually, I, I like this person, but I don't like this person. Yeah. Or, I think this happened. 
or I think that happened. You need to be a bit equivocal. I'm yeah. interested in doubt, right? right? That people who are very certain, I find scary. Yeah. Donald Trump, very certain. Yeah. I'm very scared. Jacob B. Smog, very certain. I'm mm-hmm. very scared. People who aren't sure or who are nuanced mm-hmm. or who, are, who I can see thinking, I'm interested in having a conversation. And I think the same is true of a book. You know, you want right, to feel yeah. like you're in conversation with that book, with an idea, mm. I think. Um, otherwise, it's just you're just being shouted at. Um, yeah. So, so I, I suppose, I think if people are thinking about writing memoir, they need to know that it's not biography. Biography yeah. is your whole life. It's, yeah. I was born, at some point I will die. And this is what happens in between. Mm. Me- memoir is a story um, from a life, mm. not a story of a life. Right. Very different. Yeah. So from a life could be your job, a journey, a relationship, an mm. illness, an experience. You know, mm. it's a slice, you know. It's not yeah. the whole thing. It's not a diary. You don't need to be completist. Yeah. It's, it's that's a story form. And do you think the the, the the theme of hooking it on the your you know, living in the shadow of Maggie Maggie, Thatcher, do you yeah. think that helped? Uh, for people to get their head around it or to or to, to catch the interest of the press and things I like think that. some people hated it because she <laughs> was in there. I think there were people who would not read it in Probably, public. Yeah. Because she's such she, a polarising figure. She's so polarising. And, and because I wondered, you know, when I first heard Maggie May, does this mean you're a massive Maggie thing? Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which would put me off. <laughs> exactly. And it would put a lot of people off. And I think people, I know people read it in an e-book, so the cover wasn't shown in public. Mm. And the paperback doesn't have her on there. The paperback is safe yeah, for public yeah. reading. But um, equally, that will also inevitably attract some people, which is weird. But yeah. it does. So so, so the, it was always called Maggie and Me. And it was because she was there constantly. She saturated yeah. my childhood in a way that I think is very hard with the world that we live in now, for a politician to cut through. Very yeah. few politicians have that cut through now. Um, but she was everywhere and she did everything. It seemed to me like she was involved mm. in every area of my life. And later on when I came out, um, mm. there was Section 28, which our government was yeah. responsible for, which meant that you know teachers couldn't teach homosexuality. Mm. You, you can't teach homosexuality. You can't. Some people struggle to learn maths. Homosexuality <laughs> is a much more advanced <laughs> skill. Uh, and, um, there was such I, an evil and unnecessary piece of legislation. It was yeah. And it did nothing for anybody apart from yeah. make teachers' jobs harder and punish pupils. Mm. But you know that was a problem for me. I had very brave, good teachers, so mm. I was able to deal with it. But you know, she was just there at every sort of stage of my life, really. Yeah. Um, and that's why I wanted to. So each chapter starts with a quote from her, but right. she's not a character in the book. She yeah. doesn't appear in the book, and I'm not politically conscious in the book. I'm just a child yeah, right, yeah. in the world that she's shaping. And it, I suppose it happened for me. I was. Uh, yeah, older, but uh, but still a big, big force in in of my she was. youth as yeah, well. Yeah. Of course, she was. You were probably like, you know, agitating against her and going on marches and being, you know, listening yeah, to all right. the music that was like, you know, against yeah, yeah. Her. stand down, Margaret. Yeah, all of that. To the <laughs> I was from the Midlands, so uh, well, two tone was uh, was instrumental in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, that's, so can you say anything about the new book? When does the new book come out? The new book is safe out here. in April uh, mm. 2019 and it's called You Will Be Safe Here and it's a novel. Mm-hmm. And it's set in South Africa, yeah. entirely in South Africa in 1900 and now. Okay. So it's uncovering a hidden history um, yeah. and, and looking at a present day secret and kind of linking the two things. Yeah. Um, and again, it's another thing that came about not because I thought I want to write a novel. Mm. Um, it came about because I saw a picture of a boy mm. in the newspaper. Um, and it was a boy I hadn't seen for years. It was a boy who'd come to my school in Scotland from South Africa for a year um, and who'd gone back to South Africa um, and who I'd not seen in the intervening 30 mm. years. Um, and there he was in the Daily Telegraph, big picture of him. And he'd been murdered, he'd been killed mm. um, in a sort of extreme uh, boot camp, uh, a place, their slogan is, uh, we make men out of boys, very brutal. And boys mm. die there every year. I looked at this picture of this boy who'd been murdered and realised that it couldn't be him because he would be a man now, but it looked just yeah. like him. And I became obsessed by the story of what had happened to him and I ended up um, tracking down his parents um, his mother um, and going to South Africa and mm. interviewing his mother 
going to the place where he was murdered yeah. um, and running into some of the people responsible for his death. Not very nice people, very scary. Men with guns. And realising, thinking maybe I would do a piece of journalism or something mm. like that about it, um, or maybe some non-fiction. And then I, re- I thought, well, why do these camps exist in South Africa? Mm. Why is there a network of them? Why is it accepted to send your mm. son to these places? And, um, and I realised that the answer was somewhere else. And that was an answer that I couldn't get on factually. I was going to have to mm. make some stuff up. And the answer lies in 1900, um, which is during the Second Boer War. Um, the British are losing, so they decide to do everything they can to, to win. So they ship in the empire um, hundreds of thousands of soldiers to tens of thousands of Boers, who are, Boer just means farmer. Mm. And, um, and Lord Kitchener, you know, the man from the Your Country Needs You poster, mm-hmm. um, is in charge at this point. And he creates something called Scorched Earth, and where they literally scorch the scorch the earth. So they kill all the animals, throw their innards down the well to poison the water and plough salt into the soil so nothing mm-hmm. will grow. And they create a nation of homeless women and children mm-hmm. and they have to do something with them. So what they do is they concentrate them into camps. And so this is the origin of the concentration oh, camp. Wow. So the British mm-hmm. invented the concentration camp during the Boer War. Mm-hmm. Um, and more women and children died in those camps than soldiers died on both sides of the war. So the novel is going back in time to then and we meet Sarah and her son Fred and when they're sent to this place, which is a terrible place, but which is also a place where there is hope mm. because for the first time in their lives they've been isolated farmers. For the first time in their lives they have friends, they have mm. neighbours, there are choral societies, gardening societies, spiritualist clubs, mm. churches, um, all kinds of life in these places. And so it's about survival for them then and for the contemporary characters, a boy called Willem, um, who likes books more than people and animals more than mm. people. Um, and it's about what happens to Willem when he's sent to one of these camps in the present day. So yeah. it's sort of linking the two. It's wow. quite intense. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds fascinating. It's a big, big, but it's not a big book. I cut it to very short, but it's a kind of big right, scope. Okay. You know? Yeah. Great. Okay. Who's that published by? So Bloomsbury will publish that next year. Um, and I've just this week been going around bookshops and meeting booksellers. So I've mm. this week been to thir- last week been to 36 bookshops in two, three days. What um, do you do at the bookshops? You go in with the sales rep um, and they introduce you and you talk oh, to wow. them so that they can put a face to a name and it makes really? them more likely to read the book. And, I've never heard this know. done for non-fiction. It seems to be only fiction. Um, it's interesting. I, it's, I think it's a really good idea. I mean, I yeah. think, you know, it's like, also it's just fun because you get to go to bookshops and yeah. I did quite a lot of my Christmas shopping. I just was like, I'm just getting a book in every shop and I got quite a lot done. So, um, mm. so it, is, it is interesting. I mean, it can also be a bit tiring and... Mm. Um, uh, but it is, it, is a, it is a good thing to do. So, and then tonight I'm speaking at the International Sales Conference to all the sales people right, about that. Yeah. So, it's, it's, it's a super lead title, which whatever that means. So. A what? Super lead. Okay. This is, this is, their, this is their, their speak, yeah. Really? Yeah, super lead. Okay, good. And <laughs> I keep seeing these funny little stories from you on Facebook, which, which are so hilarious, which, which they seem to happen to you a lot. One of them was, well, this one's quite serious in a way, but you reading from Maggie and me oh God, this in is, Ireland. Yeah, last last month. And and tell us what, what happened. <sighs> this is so intense. I don't know. I was, I was laughing. Uh, no, I mean, it's it, it's kind of one of those situations where you where you do laugh because it's so extraordinary. Yeah. But it was an amazing moment, actually. Um, so I was invited to a great event called Scribes at the Rock, Mm. Um, by a fantastic man, Danny. Um, and basically, it's all kinds of writers from all kinds of backgrounds coming mm. together in this bar on the Falls Road uh, in Belfast. Mm. And, and it, you know, the Falls Road, like every one of those roads, the Shank Hill and all the rest of it, they have particular uh, communities and particular mm. politics attached to them. And, mm. and, um, and this particular pub, The Rock, um, has very famously been bombed on in, in many occasions and stuff. Mm. Anyway, I was there and I was doing a reading um, with a couple of other writers and the organisers said, oh, there's somebody I want you to meet. And I turned around and, and put my hand out to shake hands and there was Jerry Adams. Wow. Um, and um, he was very charming and very polite and asked me about my book. And uh, I got up to read first 
Um, and the start of my book um, is about the night my parents divorced, about the night my mum left my dad, um, and it's the same night as the Brighton bombing. Um, and so I stood there and I said, I didn't expect to be ever be reading this in front of you, Jerry Adams. But here we go. And I went on and I, and I read it. And then the next bit was all about being the product of a mixed marriage. So my mum is Catholic and my dad right. is Protestant, um, which is a big thing in the west of Scotland. Mm. And, uh, and so I read about that. And it involves some p- particular swear words, which are particularly evocative. Um, <laughs> and I thought, am I going to read this or am I not going to read this? <laughs> And I thought I have to read it because I want you know I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I don't. Yeah. And so I did read it, and he was fantastic. Jumped up and some big round of applause, and then he subsequently waited in the queue to have his book signed, wow. um, and then sent me a tweet congratulating me on the book, which I thought was quite brave because it's mm. very critical uh, um, mm. of you know sectarianism. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and, and there he was. And there were loads of people in that room. It was a very diverse room. You know, there was a woman, Jan Carson, a writer from the other side of Belfast who'd never been on the Falls Road in her life, never yeah, been wow. in that pub. Um, there were people from both sides and they were all brought together by books and stories and they all sat there and listened. And that, that I thought was remarkable. It shows the potential for stories to heal. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, another funny little story is... You somehow ended up in a cheese spat in New Zealand. <laughs> Why do these things happen to you, Damien? No, 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 no. That's just insane. So I was I was a Scottish writers fellow at the University of Otago, and I was based right. in Auckland for three months. Okay, um, and was that, when was this? Then? Was this recent? That's just a few months ago, oh, I see. beginning okay. of this year. Um, and it was towards the end of my stay, and I'd been re- editing my novel mm. and, and doing some bits of journalism. And I did a series of tweets about what I liked and what I had found out about New Zealand while I was there. And of course, the very first one that's very important is to say New Zealand is not Australia. Um, yeah. And Kiwis are not Australians. Uh, and so sort of take it from, from there. But I talked a lot about how they have you know incredible literary culture mm. and how they need to celebrate that as much as they celebrate the All Blacks. Um, and how it's probably one of the most beautiful, I think the most beautiful country I've ever been yeah. to in the world and how much I love Jacinda Ardern, the incredible Prime Minister. Yeah. And I said, for a country that has delicious milk and very nice chocolate, they have some quite boring cheese. And then I went to bed. <laughs> this was on Twitter. This is on Twitter. Yeah. And then I went to bed and got up the next morning. And it had been retweeted thousands of times. <laughs> I mean, thousands of times. This whole thread, people weighing mm. in, saying what they thought about what I thought and all the rest of it. Anyway, and one of the people who weighed in was the Prime Minister of New Zealand, <laughs> The same to Jacinda to say, hey, I'm sorry you've had a bad experience with our cheese. I can refer you to a government cheese re-education centre. She didn't use those terms, but that's what she meant. Um, and so I went off to, to, to try cheese uh, in a nice cheese shop and, and ended up doing a segment about that on, on, on New Zealand television. But every newspaper... And on the front page. Every the newspaper, newspaper com- put it there, and, and mostly on the front page. Oh, God. I mean, it was absolutely hilarious. We called it Cheesegate. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Cheesegate was a real was a real laugh, but um, mm. maybe maybe I'll get a special cheese visa or something when I go back to New Zealand. I, yeah. d- I don't know, but anyway, yeah, it was I, an experience. I thought that was hilarious. It was hilarious. <laughs> Exchanging tweets with Jacinda about cheese. Yeah. So, given all these fascinating things, and as you said, you get yeah. asked to do a lot of things. Yes. What I was wondering about is how you decide what to do. Like, how do you? How do you choose what to say yes to and what to say no to? You mean you mean in, just in things your, that take up my time? Yeah, yeah. in your career and because you 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 you're trustee of multiple things. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, there's a lot going on. So I think there there is a lot going on, and I you know I am lucky that I work with a lot of different people who support mm. me in different ways. So I have a, a literary agent, and I have. Um, a, a screenwriting agent and I have an agent for appearances and events and they all talk to each other and they all, mm-hmm. or they all work um, excuse me um, so I, I have agents for all the for, you know who support different parts of my career and then there's a big production team for the salon mm-hmm. um, so I am not doing everything yeah, um, right. but I am involved in everything um, and what connects them all for me, probably it's stories. So 
on some level. So am I writing a story? Is it journalism? Am I telling a story on the radio? You know, because I presented front row and things like yeah. that. Um, am I writing a bigger story? Is it a book? Um, I'm just starting to do screenplays. So is it a screenplay? Something, am I, am I thinking about it like that? Am I sharing somebody else's story? Again, that could be journalism or radio. Or it could be the salon. I'm sharing a story on stage, you know, because I only ever have books that I love. So, yeah. so, it's, so, so it could be that. Um, I'm very interested in helping other people tell their stories. So I think mm. that's why I'm a patron of a Little Green Pig, which is a children's literacy charity based on 826. Mm. Um, in America, it's about getting young people reading and, and, and writing. Um, I'm on the board of Gladstone's Library, which is a residential library in Wales. Great place to go and write mm. if you ever need a quiet place. It's where the great man's books are. Um, and that's all about liberal thinking. Um, and I started a writer in residence scheme for them. Um, I'm a trustee of Brighton Fringe, which is the biggest arts festival um, in the UK after mm. um, Edinburgh. And actually the biggest arts fest- one of the biggest arts festivals in Europe. And the whole city is a venue, basically, for me. It's brilliant. So I, I, I am involved where I can make a difference. Right. I don't like to sit around and talk if I can't yeah. do something about it. Um, a couple of years ago, the local library in my village was threatened with closure, and I was able to pull together lots of different strands of my life, so big famous writers that I work with, mm. community groups, and then work with the community group on the ground to save that library from closure. Mm. I mean, that's probably one of the most satisfying things that I've ever done in my life, was to yeah. save that library. Because um, you're not just saving a library, you're saving all the people who use it and their families and their communities yeah. and, and everything. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I think quite carefully about what I say yes to and what I say no to. Mm. I have a tendency to say yes... Um, and then other people will go, well, you can't do that because you've already said you'll do this or you've already said you'll do that. Or, you yeah. know, so my, my inclination is to say, is to say, yes, I probably, I mean, I do a lot, you know, I work, I work every day. Right. So, yeah. I mean, why, why wouldn't you, if you love what you do, <laughs> yeah. why wouldn't you? I work, Seven days a week? Yeah. Right. But right. I mean, there'll be days yeah. where I don't work all day, Yeah. you know, right. where, you know, and I'm, you know, you're lucky if you get a hold of me before nine or ten in the yeah. morning. Uh, but very often I'll be working after nine or ten at night. So, but I do take holidays. I go away mm. and I'm very focused. Of course, I'm reading or whatever, or maybe I'm writing. Mm. But I don't, you know, I don't believe. I don't feel like. Oh, how can I put this? Work doesn't cost me anything. It mm. gives me a lot. Um, I don't. It doesn't mean I don't get tired. It doesn't mean I don't get annoyed mm. or. You know, it doesn't mean I don't want things to happen faster or, or whatever mm. else. It just, it's, but it's just sort of sustains me in a way that, that means I don't think I should call it work. It is life. It is yeah. my life, you know. Stories are my life. There's nothing, what am I, what am I without them? Mm. You know, what I, I don't want to live without them. And I don't want other people to live without them. So I want, it's, you know, so that's kind of my guiding mission. And the mm. salon is a business, yes, but it's also a community. You know, mm. thousands and thousands of people all around the world who are connected by a shared love of books and I just yeah. they're an amazing group of people and and it's great to hear from them mm. you know and get recommendations from them and and make them aware of stuff they don't know about so mm. um but you know I can't ever imagine a time when I'm not not doing this you know I love it and do you think deepest I guess my last question which is do you think ahead so do you know what you're doing next year or do you kind of wait until I yeah. mean some things I'm sure will be scheduled but yeah um do you kind of wait and see what arises in you or this is very this is an area of my life where I have difficulty because mm. so much is scheduled ahead that it doesn't create much space for spontaneity and that could be space in a day so I try now and build in time in each day where mm. I'm where I'm not programmed every half hour and actually mm. I can go to a gallery or I can, you know, uh, walk to the gym by a slightly longer route and maybe see something in a shop window that sparks a thought or, or something like that. So, so that is an issue, overscheduling, because mm. uh, I think we're all overscheduled and I think we need to build in, it sounds weird, build in time for spontaneity, but I think that you do need to create these spaces, otherwise mm. time just gets used up, especially if you're on your phone or, or whatever. So, yeah. um you know, I think the thing that's in my diary that's furthest ahead is, right now is probably 2020. So that will be, yeah, 
But the book, it's hardback and then paperback, so that's mm. two years. So there's a spreadsheet for the next two years, wow. month by month. Um, but, mm. you know, I, I, there's a comfort in that. I like, yeah, I like sure. knowing what I'm doing. And um, because of my journalistic background, mm. my first job out of university was at the Times, I am very strict about deadlines. So I don't mm. miss deadlines. Um, end of. That never, right. just never, that never happens. Um, but that does mean that often I'm working like a crazy person trying to kind of get everything done. Yeah. Um, but I, I, if I could change the balance, how would I do it? Um, I'd probably just like to have even more great people working with me on the salon. Mm. It would be nice to be able to have more people, and probably we will have, I yeah. think, at some point. I mean, one of the partnerships we do that I really like is called A Book and a Bottle mm. with Corny and Barrow. Um, who, where, which is about pairing wines and pairing food and that came about because I was writing a column for the Sunday Times about wine and drinks and you know that to me seemed a natural extension and they're a really nice band to work with and they do a lot of really good work for this project so I'm always looking at like if I'm working with a brand you know, what, what are they what are they bringing to it and how are they bringing it to life yeah. you know, rather than just letting them sort of piggyback or, or just mm. taking money you know, I, I, I'm interested in partnerships right. all the time. So more partnerships that would enable me yeah. maybe to do a little bit less of some things and a little bit more of other things. Right. That's great. It sounds like people have been the key to your success and your ability to create communities and create partnerships. Sounds like it's really instrumental to all of that. If You, it's, it, you can have all the great ideas in the world, but if it's just you doing them, then... I'm, I want to spend time with other people. You know, mm-hmm. I'm very sociable, and I, for me, you know, uh, uh, that's what I, that's what I want. Um, I want to be having conversations, and I want mm-hmm. other people to be having conversations, and, uh, and I'd like to listen in. Um, yeah. You know, and that people are central to that. You know, yeah. people, and I think you've got to make people feel welcomed. You've got to make people feel valued. You've got to listen when they're telling you that you're getting something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, You've got to listen when they say to you, this is what you want for me, not what I want for me. Or, you know, and I, I think that, you know, it can be hard. And I'm, mm. it, I probably need to spend a bit more, even more time listening, actually. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'd love to find out more about what other people are doing, you know, with, with literary events in other parts of the world. You know, I'd like yeah. to spend more time going out and doing research and just sitting, listening. Yeah. Um, that's a luxury. That's great. I'm on the advisory board at Cheltenham. And so when I go to Cheltenham, I can go to sort of kind of any event I want. Mm. And I remember listening, sitting listening to Hillary Clinton the other year, sort of oh, two, yeah. two rows from the front. In fact, there was nobody in front of me because Secret Service had taken all, <laughs> and taken all those seats. Yeah. And, um, and I remember sort of sitting there thinking, this is an amazingly powerful, interesting woman yeah. who should be the president of the United States of mm. America. And thinking what a privilege it was to hear her, hear her talking. And in a couple of weeks, I'm interviewing Nicola Sturgeon about her love of oh, really? speaking of amazing, mm-hmm. strong women. So, you know, I'm very lucky. But for me, it's always about people. Yeah. I'm interested in the, in, the, in the people, whether they're on the page or on mm. the stage or you know, in a community or whatever it is. That's, that's what motivates me. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And, and if people want to find out about everything that you do, is a one place? Uh, if they just go to um, militarysalon.co.uk, I think it is, then okay. they can find out about the salon from there. Um, and, you know, I pop up here and there with other things that I do myself. I amazingly don't have a website. I've managed to get yeah. away without it. People can piece bits of me together, but yeah. the Literary Salon is probably the easiest place to, to look. Right. And it's also on okay. Facebook and on Instagram and on, and on all those yeah. places. So, Great. Great. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I've loved it. I've really loved it. It's a chance to talk about things in such a different way. Yeah. You know, um, which I don't get to do very often. So thank you. That That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Ideas Lab podcast. Please do subscribe. And if you've enjoyed this episode, it would be great if you could leave us a review. You can get links and details of everything mentioned in the podcast in the show notes, along with photos and video clips from many of our episodes. Just go to theideaslab.org forward slash podcast.